Hello everybody and welcome to the Sober Stew podcast. You are listening and watching a recovery podcast. Today, my guest, Orla Little, coming on to share her journey into sobriety with you. Orla, welcome and welcome to the show. Thank you, Stu, for asking me to be a guest on your show. Um, I'm completely honoured to share my story with everybody. All up, fan. Listen, we, we can hear from your, your accent that you're Irish and you're from Ireland. Are you still living in Ireland or are you in the uh, UK? No. So I'm stuck here in the Leicestershire. I married a Hinkley man, so I'm stuck here. <laughs> Till I can persuade him to move back home. Um, so I'm from Galway uh, okay. originally. Yeah, the west of Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Very beautiful place, yeah. I'm told. Oh, absolutely picturesque. Uh, absolutely picturesque. Connemara is fantastic if you ever get to go there. Beautiful. And it's not like that in Leicestershire, no? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's green, no. Okay, so, oh, stop. so you moved to the UK, you moved to England when you met your when you met your husband? In Is, it, is that how it happened or was you already here? No, I was already here. So... Um, where I got I got sober in Ireland, okay. um, so, so I moved back to the UK. I got I actually trained in Canterbury in Kent oh, wow. as a nurse. That's down yeah. the road from me. That's not far from yeah, me. Yeah, so I went to my first meeting in Kent many years ago, many right. many years ago, and then then went back out and drank for another four years, and then okay. got, got a bit more misery. Sober then eventually, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Do you've just listen. I say this every week. I've got a fact find in front of me. You put yeah. You put loads of information on, so I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. You've had a journey, haven't you? You've 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 had a very yeah. a very detailed journey um, in addiction, in sobriety. Um, so where do we start, yeah. Aura? Where are we going to start? We... <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, you tell you t- you take me to where you want to start. You know, like I've got here that you originally said you didn't want to drink in- until you was in your twenties. Yeah. Yeah, so what you do back home, I'm Catholic by faith, uh, but more spiritual since I got into recovery, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, so when I was Catholic, I got, went to school, went to a Catholic church, and you take what's known as a pledge. So uh-huh. you take a pledge until you're like 18 to, to not drink. Um, and I broke that pledge at 13, yeah. Um, a family member had got engaged, and uh, <laughs> my first drink was uh, Bailey's and brandy, and then just my life completely changed, you know. Um, before that, I was very shy and um, timid, I suppose, and shy and, and uh, quiet kind of thing. And then the minute I that took that first drink, just something just released in me, I suppose. And I was a different person, you know. You, and you, that saying that I hear so much uh, that you feel like you've arrived, is that how you felt? Like you've banged your ear? Yeah, it's just kind of, I, I, I never felt sorry I never fit in you know yeah. in school and I was bullied and and yeah. I was wondering why I was being picked on constantly and they used to call me because I'm six foot they called me lanky legs and four eyes because I wore glasses and they like commented about where you grew up and things like that you know rough neighborhoods and all you name it I had it you know and uh, I suppose I needed an escape and the minute I tasted that drink that was my escape and then we do a thing back in Ireland called bushing so it's knacker drinking, you know, you, 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 you go to the off license or you get someone to go to the off license and you go uh, bushing in the bushes or out in the beach where we would have, you know, me and my friends kind of thing. Um, but it, it's kind of like I was in nightclubs at the age because I have an older sister. I was in nightclubs at the age of 15, yeah, in yeah. 20, over 21 nightclubs being chatted up by 26 year old men. Like, you know, yeah, that's not good, is it? <laughs> because I looked older, yeah, I bet, yeah, um, yeah. and um, that's I just thought it was it? the norm, really, yeah, do you know. But you put it, you're in dangerous situations yeah. from a you know, look, when I look back at 15 and you look back at 15, you don't feel that you felt like you was a child. But the reality is you are, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. I remember going over to Cyprus. I went to Cyprus at 16 and um, I think it was about 16, yeah. And like there was a guy that owned the pub there and he was 36, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. crazy stuff. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Um, you know, and it's just when I look back at it, I wouldn't want my daughter Doing, having that behavior you know what I mean or my son even do you know yeah of course of course so you're you're then in these nightclubs at 15 and I'm assuming you're drinking heavily from that age because you you were yeah. drinking at 13 so that's that's that in them yeah. two years it can it can progress quite quickly can't it yeah yeah exactly 
And like, obviously I would have been only a binge drinker at the start. And I yeah. kind of more of my journey was binge drinking, but I drank quantities of like, you heard the drinks called Goldschlager, um, yep. Jägermeister, yeah, all yeah. those kind of things. And vodka, I could drink straight vodka as if it was pure water. Like At that age? Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. well, going on in my journey. I mean, my journey stopped at 24. I was lucky I got into the rooms at 24 years of age. Yeah. But I drank heavily until that age. Like, okay. Um, and I lost, um, I could have lost a lot of, I, you know, I could have lost a lot of family over it. I nearly lost my family over it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but I'm a nurse by qualification. I went into my uh, an exam to sit an exam after going to bed about four o'clock in the morning. Do you know what I mean? And I went in to sit an exam. And then I wonder why I failed it. Do you know what I mean? It's awesome, better, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I got told by the Dean of Nursing to come back when I was physically, mentally and emotionally able for the course. And that's when I went into the rooms of AA originally. Oh, wow. Do you know what? You just yeah. reminded me of something, right? When I was 17, I was doing my driving lessons and uh, I used to get in at four, five, six in the morning and my driving instructor would pick me up. And yeah. I get in the car and he look at me and go, oh, for fuck's sake, not again. I go, I, I, I've had an hour's sleep and I must be reeking of booze. Do you know? But yeah. he, would, he would let me take my lesson. Like I don't even, And I think I only done eight lessons. He'd probably just push me out of the door and go, get out of the way. <laughs> but you know what? It's a madness yeah. and it seemed normal. Yeah. did seem normal, but yeah, it's not, is it? Oh, no. Like, you think, like, you're in student life, you think that's the norm. But then yeah. my friends would question it and say, no, we don't want to go out every night. And do you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's it's not the norm. Do you know what I mean? And um, I think it was inevitable I was going to be the next because I have members of my family in recovery. Um, and they could see what I couldn't see at the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. So what? So what is the recovery fellowships like in Ireland? Because I've ne- I've never been to Ireland, and I've got some friends. Oh, you have to go. Yeah, I want to go. I do want to go. Definitely. Oh, and definitely. Many friends in recovery who who originate from Ireland and known for for many years, and um, they t- they tell me some beautiful stories. But is the fellowship a yeah. tight, close knit community? Very, very tight, close, and that's one of the things I miss about being over here. Um, I really miss the Irish fellowship because. Um, so in Galway, it's complicated because they knew who I was related to. So that that kind of put the complication into because Galway has the All Ireland conventions held, you know, on the prom. Um, look it up. Yeah, it's fantastic. And and I've shared my story. Um, you know the way you share at a meeting, and I've sta- shared at the convention. Um, at the Galway convention, do you know? But I got sober originally in Dublin. In um. Molesworth Street. It's just off near where you get. Actually, it's near the passport office in Dublin. Okay. So I got so I got sober in Dublin, and uh, when I was working as a nurse, and um, I was close to losing my job actually, and I got sacked uh, three oh, wow. weeks sober. Yeah, I was three weeks sober, and I got sacked. Is that because of something remember, happened before? Um, just because of my reckless behaviour. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like that. I oh, I should have been looking after my my patients, but I was coming in hungover and. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Calling in sick and, and uh, do you know, it's my reckless behavior that, that got me sacked, really. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, w- it was a blessing in disguise because I found a meeting r- uh, close to where I was working. And I actually remember going to the meeting. It was in the back of the church because most meetings are in the back of the church. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <And they, laughs> meetings. And I remember I was I was I broke down in tears because I was like, not another job like that I've been sacked from. And um this woman that I worked with, I didn't realize and she didn't realize that she was in AA and I was in, I was trying to get sober. And she was like, if only I'd known that, you, you know, that you were like me, I could have helped. But I'll just um, tell you that the job I was working on, it was in the liver. So it was working with people with alcoholics, like, you know, that were uh, detoxing and things like that. And that's the kind of career that I've, I've got most uh, experience of working as li- with the liver, like. Um, which is kind of ironic in a way, isn't it? Um, so when I did get sober, you know, when I went back to that type of job, I, I actually was a nurse specialist um, not so long ago before I had my son. So I wor- right. worked with um, with people that have had um, really bad damage to their liver, that have chronic um, liver cirrhosis and things like that, you know. And yeah. um, I found it really rewarding, but it gave me the kind of look at if I ever relapse, this is what would happen. This is the not yet for me. Um, yeah. so it kept my sobriety strong I think anyway 
Oh, no. Jesus Christ, 100%. And do you know what? I didn't realise yeah. that you, you've worked in that field. And maybe, yeah. maybe for our listeners and for our viewers, you know, maybe we could give a little, an idea of what happens to the liver when you abuse yeah. it with alcohol. Yeah. Um, so what they do is they scan your liver to see the damage that um, it's it's been taken by alcohol. And I had one patient in particular and um, he didn't realise that, that he had such damage um, been made to his liver. Like, and this man was trying to get sober constantly. Right. Um, he had hepatitis C in the end as well, um, which can also be given to you yeah. um, because of the damage you do to your liver, you know? Um, but yeah, I've, um, I've met some, some people that would like really break your heart. Like um, I remember working in Surrey. I have a long story. I moved to Ireland back, got sober, then moved over to Surrey and worked in the digestive diseases, which is to do with liver um, over in Surrey. And I was working there and I was le- working, I was nursing uh, alcoholics. Um, and when I was nursing alcoholics, I was sober. So I had, was a good few years sober by then and I was going to meetings and, and working my program. But my colleagues never knew. Right. So like I was the one that kind of was nursing them. Um, and, you know, like I would kind of look at the person holistically and Folks. look at them and go, you know, that could be me in the bed. Do you know what I mean? And it could have easily have been me in the bed. Um, and I remember like my 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 colleagues, some of them weren't so uh, caring. Let's just okay. put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is really sad, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, some um, people really, look at really an alcoholic. Sad. Yes, listen, yeah. I know firsthand. Yeah. People look at an alcoholic and go, "It's his yeah. fault. It's her fault. Yeah. She should yeah. stop. They shouldn't yeah. do that." They don't understand yeah. that it's a, it's it's a, it's an illness. It's a disease that yeah. that. Well, for one, I will say it a lot. Yeah. It, it tells you you ain't got it. You know, I don't know any other disease yeah. that does that. And secondly, it's, it's 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 you know it's lodged in the brain. You know, it's very yeah, difficult, yeah. very difficult. And oh, not, definitely. And not many people get out of that out of that addiction whether they live in it for the rest of their life and they use or they die i nursed um men and women that had wet brain and i'm telling you it did open my eyes it yeah, completely it did. did you know, uh, do you know and what? i wasn't I've, long sober I've, at the time do you know what i mean i've when never met anyone them. i've never met anyone with a wet brain but i've i've known people who have and it's a scary thing it's a scary thing yeah. to see isn't it oh big time big time um, and also when I got newly sober, I was working in um, Pierce Street, which is um, a methadone clinic. So I worked in that side of addiction. I was um, working in the addiction services back home in Dublin where I'd gotten sober. So it was like minutes from meetings, which yeah. was great because I went to a meeting every lunchtime. Do you know what I mean? Because I was still trying to keep my sobriety while working with addicts. Like, but I found it so rewarding, do you know? Yeah. And it was the, like, like I say, it was the not yet drugs. Luckily, aren't my story, but they could have been my story easily. Um, it's just the drink. Um, I liked the drink. And that sounded <laughs> like, well, and it sounded like it done enough damage to you yeah. itself. You didn't need anything else to do any more damage. No, no. Now this is a terrible story, but I remember uh, for a woman anyway. I remember before I got sober, I remember waking up and I saw Mount Joy Prison, which is a famous prison in Ireland. Um, I fa- saw it at the corner of the window and I woke up and I was in a room with eight men, eight lads, like, and I couldn't remember how I got there. I remember talking to them and that's it. That's how blacked out it was. Now that is dangerous for a woman. Like, you know, luckily nothing happened to me. No, but listen, but that's that's a serious question. How do you then feel when you come round out of that blackout? Yeah. And you're with eight geezers, eight men that you don't know. How do you feel as a woman? Oh shit. Very shameful. Very, very shameful. Yeah, very, very shameful. Scared? And um, when I look back, oh, terror is scary. Like, cause I, yeah, man. then I found out that I was only like chatting with one of them, if that makes sense. And they yeah. all like were housemates type of thing. You know, luckily no one touched me. I was so lucky, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Jesus, it's, it's terrifying. Like, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I got sober short, shortly after that, you okay. know, um, a member of my family, found a woman because you know the way you stick with women men stick with women or men stick with women <laughs> <laughs> sorry it's my few sense of humor men stick with men and women stick with women yeah. and uh, luckily a family member um got a woman in dublin that knew that they were sober and um got me to a meeting and i, w- I never looked back i've been sober since the day of the time thank god yeah, and it'll be 18 beautiful. years this year 18 years um, this year, yeah, 29th Magic. of April. I still can't believe it, to be honest. I just, <laughs> you know, 
That's can't believe lovely. it. Do you know? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. yeah. It is. I just, I just can't believe it. Like um, all the things I've gone through, like I, I've written about, and you've seen that I've gone through lots of trauma in my yeah. sobriety and recovery, and I still can't believe I've not picked up a drink. I came close to it. I got into a treatment center three and a half years sober. My family got me into it, Ashiree, which is a treatment center down in Tipperary, and that's where I got the relationship back with my dad because I had lost that relationship with my dad. Do you want to tell us how you ended up in a treatment center three and a half years into sobriety? Because yeah. that's, that's pivotal, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So I was going to my meetings. I did the I did over ninety meetings. You know the way they say ninety meetings in ninety days when I was yeah. getting sober. Um, I worked the steps. I had a sponsor. I was trying to do everything by the book. I was trying not to get into the relationships for two years. Of course, that didn't work out. Never does. And I was in relationships and in controlling relationships. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and how I got into uh, down to Ashiree, uh, my family had to get put me down to a treatment center because I nearly uh, basically I started looking at everybody's recovery and then looking at myself and and then getting complacent and saying, oh. You know, I did like basically it would be like, oh, I wasn't arrested. I, my stomach wasn't pumped. Maybe I'm not an alcoholic. Do you know what I mean? And kept on looking and looking and looking. And um, I was one of these runners. This is so basically what I had to do in Ashiree because it was a drug treatment center and people were just newly sober. And there's me with three and a half years sobriety, but a dry drunk. Um, I had to do a collage out and explain to them that I was a runner. So I would run for the hills and not face my reality. So I, you know what I mean? I would constantly live in daydream land and wouldn't face reality. Um, so it's only by going to Ashiree, it saved my life. You're, you're, you're a very honest woman. I love that. I find that really beautiful. So thank you for sharing everything so far yeah. that you've shared. Because I find, you know, honesty and recovery is massive. And what you've... Oh, massive. Yeah. Well, do you know what, what? What you said then, when you went into that treatment centre, it sounds like you surrendered for the first time properly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And before um, that, you was... What, what was you doing before that? Just holding on? I'm not, I'm not too quite sure. I think it was what I was told by the counsellors is I was an alcoholic or in recovery, but then I didn't realise I was an addict as well because um, I'm not afraid to admit that the sex addiction could have, you know what I mean, took me yeah. over, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. um, And there is a lot of addictions, as you know. Like, I mean, I started getting addicted to shopping, hence why the debt crew blew yeah. up. Um Facebook, I had to come off Facebook and, yeah, and yeah. social media for a while. Do you know what I mean? And I still have to be careful of that because I, now I know I'm an addict. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I can get addicted to bloody anything. Anything, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's the thing. Alcoholics, uh, I don't think you can just be an alcoholic. I think yeah. you have that addictive behavior. Do you know yeah, what I mean? And for me, yeah. definitely had the addictive behavior. I think. You know? The reality is the way I look at an addict, or is the fact that what you're trying to do is change the way you feel. So whether that's yeah. drink, drugs, sex, yeah. food, gambling, yeah. shopping, yeah. social yeah. media, whatever it might be, you're yeah. changing the way you feel. Yeah. You? So that yeah. is that. So that tells me that an addict's core issue is their thinking. Yeah, big time. It's a massive, massive. It's a disease of the brain. I think, really personally, I think that um, it's a disease of the mind and the brain. You know, um, I was like in a little prison in my own mind, basically. And I remember going to it. I remember actually sharing this. I, I There was girl. This is really tragic. This girl that I actually got went into my first meeting with. Um, when I say first meeting, it was the second time round and my last time, as I call it. Um, she uh, worked as a nurse, actually, as well. And she ended up in that prison that I mentioned. Oh, and wow. you know how she ended up in that prison? She smashed someone over the... Oh, face with a, a glass bottle now that could have been me do you yeah. know what I mean I remember this I was I was trying to get sober and I was going to meetings and I was trying to get her to come to the meeting and uh, she was like went out that night and that's what happened she ended up in Mount Joy like do you know um, what? and I'll never ever forget it no. we've all got journeys haven't we right and I'm, yeah. I'm a firm believer in you know where we end up or where we are today is where we're mm. meant to be but you know yeah. and sometimes you never know what the reason no. is but that was her journey what do you know yeah. After her? yeah she eventually got out um but I don't know if she's sober um mm. another guy I knew that I went to my meeting started going getting sober with he ended up taking his own life unfortunately yeah, 
Yeah. Um, he was big into the crystals because, as you can see, I'm big into my spiritualism. Um, yeah, same. Crystals and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You Reiki know. is definitely my go-to for everything. <laughs> Well, the way I see this is, is that if you're putting things into your life that are not damaging, uh, and they, and they give you a, you know, give you a calming sense of belief or whatever it might be, then listen, bring it on. That's yeah. what I say yeah. because it's a yeah. far cry from our life used to be. That's for sure. Oh yeah, exactly. Like I'm very wary of, um, you know, like I have endometriosis, which is a um, condition, a woman's condition that they have of their womb. That's right. And yep. like I was putting on lots of medication. Um, they started putting me on, um, they started giving me codeine and I said, no, I'm allergic to codeine because I took it in my, it, before I got sober, I took yeah. tramadol. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So anything prescription wise, I am extremely cautious about, I was on morphine because of the pain. I'll take yep. it for pain, but now I'm off it. Um, now that I've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, I do not want to go near prescription drugs if I can help it because no. I know what my mind is like. Hello guys. Hope you're enjoying this week's episode. Just a quick break here. I want to ask you a big favour. If you are enjoying the show, enjoying the episode, enjoying the podcast, can you please subscribe, please like, please share? I just want to let you know how important that is. It, the bigger this channel gets, the more people that see it, means that we can affect people's sobriety in a positive way, their addiction recovery. We might change a life. We might save a life. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's it's exactly what it is. It's what the mind is yeah. like, isn't it? And it's yeah. um yeah, my listen, I'd be the same. Even even to the point in recovery, for me, I've had some really low moments in the uh, in recovery, depression, like bad mental health. And yeah. when I saw a doctor maybe eight, ten years ago, he, he very quick to want to prescribe me with um antidepressants and I took them. Uh, like I took them off it, took the prescription, I got them and I got home and I think I took them for I maybe three, four weeks or something like that. And then I had a realisation one day. I'm like, I don't want to put something in me to change the way I feel. Yeah. You know, I, I was, I think I was eight, nine years in, in recovery at the time. And I thought, this don't feel right. It didn't feel right to me personally. So I, I didn't yeah. do it. I stopped it because it just felt, I need to feel who I am and I need to work on what's going on. That's how I felt. Yeah. Yeah. I've been given Stretrolin, which is an antidepressant, three times. And like yourself, I've only taken it for a little time right. and then come off it because like, I, I have postnatal depression and anxiety after my daughter uh, okay. because of everything I went through with, with the pregnancies and everything. And I had it with my son as well. And I was actually put on Zopiclone, which is a sleeper, uh, yeah. after my son. But I couldn't take it. I'm in recovery. I don't want that in my body. Do you know what I mean? Um, th for me, therapy helps. Like I've been, like I said, I've been through a lot of trauma. I was in a narcissistic, abusive relationship that I mentioned um, in the the fact log thing that I filled out for you, and um, uh, close to like I was sexually abused by him as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that was really traumatic. But it's not until my, I met my husband that I realised I hadn't um, what you were. I hadn't. Got, I hadn't overcome that trauma. Yeah. Um, so then I had to go, when I met my husband, Stuart, we're two, his name is Stuart. Uh -huh. <laughs> we're, um, we're six years together in April, actually. Nice. And um, yeah, and we met on Tinder. Lovely. And, um, yeah, but we, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> I know, look, I had I, no trust. When I met him, I was almost four years single and I had no trust in men at all. No. And um I, I just kept on picking the wrong ones. Do you know what I mean? From yeah, yeah. narcissism to, to control freaks to, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I really do. abusive men yeah. kind of thing. And anyway, uh, my steward, I had to go through this four years or four months, sorry, four months of trauma therapy um, to get over what I'd been in my past because it kept on coming up. Do you know what I mean? It kept on being re-triggered. And I was diagnosed with complex PTSD um, because of everything that had because I drank on all everything that I, and I was in blackout a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's only in my dreams that everything that I've been through yeah. came back. Yeah. Um, so I was diagnosed with, I went to a pain clinic um, to do with my endometriosis actually. And I was diagnosed with PTSD and wow. um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, yeah. So then I did four months of um, intense narrative exposure therapy, which is a new therapy that you do um, when you've been in a, uh, uh, multiple um relationships like narcissism and okay. um gaslighting and that you know 
And was those relationships, or was they one after the other in concurrent, and they was all, what should we call them, sick, unhealthy, toxic? Yeah, yeah. So I was with a Canadian guy I met actually on Match.com um, when I first got sober. Um, like I say, I didn't listen to my sponsor well, yeah, did yeah. I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm guilty, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um, he actually, the 40, cl- the 40 foot is like um, a, a cliff basically and you dive off the cliff in uh, Dublin where I lived um right. and uh, I I was that in that much emotional pain in that relationship that I nearly threw myself off the cliff like that's how wow. much pain that that man caused right. um because and I caused myself by being with that man if that makes sense yeah like, it does you know? yeah, yeah um but I didn't um what's the word I didn't um, change my behavior I went from another one to another one to another one was that that's pretty why... instant as well were they yeah. pretty instant yeah so, yeah. There, so there's that... your addictive behavior that's untreated yeah. isn't it oh and the massively that's the suitcase that's the suitcase you know it? what I mean that's yeah, what yeah. yeah so I had to explain all of this down in the treatment center what my behavior um was like uh even when when I just tried to get sober, my behavior and my addictive behavior, and I need to change my thinking and how I, um, how do I say, how do I look after myself, I suppose, because it's about self-care and self-love. And I didn't love my, yeah, I definitely didn't love myself. Do you know what I mean? I might have liked myself when I first got sober, but I definitely didn't love myself. And And self-love. You might not have known yourself as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That takes a bit of time, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had years of family counselling or therapy, but it's not until I did my own personal journey of therapy and and that and started looking at myself and unpeeling the the onion and doing the steps that I started to know what my true self is like. Do you know what I mean? And my true beliefs. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that that therapy, um, getting back to Stuart, Mm -hmm. that therapy um, made me accept that... um, that there is kind of there's nice basically it looked at me um my relationships with men it looked differently at the relationships of men that I was used to and the relationships with men I deserve and um I remember pushing him away constantly he oh god the amount of times I pushed that poor lad away and we're married three years now and we yeah, have yeah. two beautiful living children do you know what I mean yeah and a dog I can't yeah, yeah. I can't forget Molly my my spaniel she'll be in yeah, the yeah. jigs <laughs> Ola, did that, you think yeah. he was pushing him away because you didn't feel like you deserved it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. Big time. Because oh, yeah. I was so used to being abused and walked on. I was the uh, fallback girl. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, so I was the kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. the fallback girl, the, f- the one that you would just go for fun or do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm on about. And then, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then settle down with someone else because that kept on happening with me. Right. Do you know what I mean? Relationship wise, do you know? Yeah, do you know what? That actually makes me feel quite upset, actually, hearing that, because no. that's not nice, man. That's horrible, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not nice. But it was it's the not. truth. And then, and that kicks your self-esteem through the fucking yeah. floor, doesn't it? Excuse my language. Massively. Really. Yeah. Massively. Time after massively. time after time. Yeah, massively. Um, And it makes you doubt yourself constantly. Yeah. Like then, I went from there, before I actually met my husband, I went, I met a man um, online again. <laughs> thinking oh he's the one you know as you do <laughs> accepted I was in recovery he didn't he accepted my, I was in recovery yet met he made wine in his house what? do you know what I mean really yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you see and he was a party animal even though he accepted I was in recovery and went to hey that, no that wasn't gonna work no. um he actually had an affair and um I thought he broke my heart at the time but to be honest he he gave me um done you a favor a yeah, yeah he yeah. done me a favor he gave me um a, a way out or, yeah. or i don't know how i'm going to describe it but it so was the out, best it? thing that yeah, could have happened you needed that the get best out thing. It yeah yeah definitely and yeah and i moved up to derbyshire um for him i moved from surrey to derbyshire for him wow. and i had never moved anywhere for anybody <laughs> so, how so did yeah you- so what happened then? So how are you changing your mindset, right, in, in, in regards to relationships? Because if you're moving for people, like, across mm. up, up the countries and that, and you get yeah. involved with men who are unhealthy, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like very unfucking healthy, yeah. Um, how did your mindset change? Did it change when you was in that treatment centre at three and a half years? Or was it the steps that did it? What was the, what was the 
you know, I'm worth more than this shit. Where did that moment come from? So it was the steps, but I also went through, um, like I said, personal therapy as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so I had a EMDR, um, which is, I I can't pronounce, pronounce the thing, you know, EMDR when they yeah. do the first, e, um, yeah, yeah, I've had CBT. I've had lots of different uh, therapy. Um, I started, I went to CODA as well, which is okay. Codependence Anonymous because yeah. I realized oh, you know I'm codependent. That's a biggie. Yeah. That's a biggie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I realized I'm codependent. Huh? Did you work the, the program? No, okay. no. But, but no. you got tools from there. Yeah, definitely. And right. I read Melanie Beatty, who's the, Melanie you know, Beattie. she yeah, writes yeah. books. Yeah. yeah. It's not a, um, you know, <laughs> my, my sponsor years ago, you just made me remember something, right? I think I was about 18 months sober and I've just come out of another shitty relationship that I said I wouldn't get in early in recovery. <laughs> and he took me to a... Uh, codependence anonymous meeting and i thought why is he doing this when i sat and i and i sat in there with him and i sat there and i listened to everyone talk and i thought oh fucking hell i'm like i'm so codependent it's unreal like I, I, i'm real and i would get in any relationship any relationship that presented to me that they liked me that's how it was whether i wanted to be in that relationship or not was irrelevant that didn't even come into my thinking it's because yeah. they showed me that they liked me i was I was happy with that. That was enough because I felt yeah. so shitty about myself. That's sad, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is really sad. Um, I had a b uh, abandonment issues because my dad left when I was five. Um, so I had abandonment issues. So I suppose I always had that fear of that abandonment. So when I like, for example, I'll tell you about the most abusive man that was in my rela um, relationship history is, is my ex um, years ago that I write about in the book. And the night I met him, he had crashed his car and went to this nightclub and was I was absolutely hammered and he was absolutely hammered and we just fell in together a mess, like, do you know? And this is before I got sober, do you know what I mean? And um yeah, and uh it's just I just I don't know, I didn't although I was sober, I didn't change the relationship I had with myself. So therefore I didn't think I was worthy of a nicer person until I met my husband. I mean, I couldn't even compare my husband to anyone else I've been with. Like, did, you know, I just couldn't, you know. Yeah, I actually lost a close friend of mine who I'd been friends with for four years because she clo she compared my husband to an, a, her abusive ex-husband, do you know what I mean? Over yeah. something, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Which I don't want to share about, but yeah, I was, yeah. I, I just said, no, she can't be in my life because if someone's that toxic, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. You've, got to, you've got to do what you've got to do when you want to get well yeah. and this is the yeah. thing isn't it you know I say this to yeah. people a lot of the time you know when you want to get well that's when you, you you've got to make some big decisions yeah big time big I've lost them. a lot of people in my life um, that were like in and out of the rooms kind of thing or not even people that are in recovery but people that do you damage or do your family damage or your, or your like that like your husband say things that they don't even know what they're talking about no. but because they're in so much pain and uh, they just lash out at you. Um, yeah. And then I'm like, no. Um, so that was before Christmas. I'm, I'm very hurt about it. It's knocked me for six because this person, I supported them through everything in their life. And they actually been through multiple baby losses like I have, you know what I mean? And 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 everything like that. This person is in rec isn't in recovery, but sent me messages at half two in the morning. So it makes me think uh, she might have had a few gargles. <laughs> That's what I think anyway. Do you know what I mean? I'd say maybe you're Possibly. right. Yeah, maybe possibly. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a um. There's a small chance, eh? <laughs> there's yeah. A small chance. yeah. And the there's behavior. A tiny chance. Yeah, yeah. If you've got that, like you say, that toxic behavior, and, and yeah, and it may maybe maybe you're right, eh? Maybe yeah. you're right. But yeah, you know, I want to dive in a little bit to the twelve steps as well because you mentioned that they helped change the way you you, you think. How did you get on yeah. with them? It, was you was you up for it because some people bulk at it and don't do it or stop and hold back what was your what was your journey with them um so i've done them three times because oh, i've wow. had like eight <laughs> yeah yeah um it's only because i did them before i went into to so i my, a lot of my sponsors were american um okay. to begin with and um, so they do them slightly different don't they they do some do it with the big book and some yep. do it with the 12 by 12 um, so yeah, so I did them um, when before I went into treatment, and then I did them after I came out with the treatment center. And I think doing them after I came out with the treatment center, I just basically, especially um, step, step six. Um, sorry, I'm trying to step four. 
yeah, yeah. I did it more thoroughly that time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Than I did more it honest. previous times. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm and brutally so- honest. I mean, I have to be brutally honest. Like, do you know, if like if you're in a meeting, like I don't cross share. I try not to cross share in a meeting. But if someone upsets me in a meeting, I'll say it to them afterwards. Yeah, you know, or or something like that, and I'll, I'll be honest about it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you're worth that opinion, aren't you? Yeah. When you're yeah, sober, definitely. you're not a doormat, are you? Yeah. No, exactly. I was a doormat all my life, so. I'll, I'll ex- you know, I'm, I touched upon it earlier, and I've touched upon it on a few podcasts. You know, I was, I'm 19 years. I was 19 years in November, just gone, and. You know, I've made some terrible, terrible choices, decisions, actions. Um, you know, in in recovery, there's periods in in relationships where I've been toxic. I've been narcissistic. You know, I will own that. I've I've, I've earned a living in ways I shouldn't have earned a living. Sometimes in recovery, yeah. you know, when I yeah. weren't working, no program at all. I'll yeah. own that as well because yeah, being honest is important. So yeah, yeah, of course. You know, if you're in recovery and you're not looking at yourself, yeah things can go fucking wonky quickly i think is yeah. Is, yeah. is is definitely. my experience yeah yeah definitely it's made me more mindful like if i say something to someone in a text or a phone call i'll yeah. ring them up and say sorry or even my husband i'll say sorry Stu, i didn't mean it like that if i snap or, or things like that i'm very mindful of my actions now yeah, which yeah. when i was drinking i was like <laughs> <laughs> Stop. what did what did my therapist said you wouldn't like you know you couldn't lie straight if if you tried you know what i mean because it was just ridiculous i used to like tell lies and then like they the, the retreat would catch up with me eventually because i'd tell yeah. everybody different yeah. stories type All of thing, day you know? long. i had this yeah. chat with someone earlier you know when yeah. you're in active addiction you cannot yeah. not lie you have to lie yeah you have to yeah. be manipulative because you can't yeah. survive otherwise yeah, and if you know, it's just a part and parcel of the, of of the life. I think, uh, and the yeah. end of the illness that just comes with yeah. it. If you're in addiction, right, and if someone's watching this or listening to this now, and you're living with addiction, and you say you're 100 yeah. percent honest, I don't believe that. I can't believe yeah. that. I cannot see yeah. how somebody who lives with addiction is 100 percent honest. Yeah. yeah, it don't go yeah. together. Yeah, I challenge it yeah, every exactly. day. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually lucky that my husband, um, he's not in recovery. He doesn't need to be in recovery. He's an occasional drinker. Like basically he drinks every bloody month or two months or do you know what I mean? Six months. Do you know what I mean? He's one of those that likes to go out with the lads and and a normal drinker, if you you like. Um, But he's The strange ones, you mean? The strange ones, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, he accepts it me for me. Do you know what I mean? He just mm. doesn't like never ever questioned it. Very proud of me. And um, like when we were going through, um, we lost our twins in lockdown. Actually, um, I was ten and a half weeks pregnant, so it was early pregnancy. Lachlan would have been about. I'm trying to think. Uh, I think when he was about six months old, we decided to try for a sibling for him because of my age with my me having endometriosis. So I never said actually Lachlan was uh, a miracle baby in my eyes because I was told that we would need IVF if I didn't conceive him um, in three months. So luckily I, I had surgery in December 18 and then I found fell pregnant um, in the February and found out in March that I was expecting him in 2019 and then he was born on Halloween. Um, he's my Beautiful. little, yeah, he's my little miracle man. Mir- yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so when he was six months old, because of our age, uh, my husband is three months younger than me. So we're both the same age. We're both we're both the same age. We're forty two. Uh, we okay. decided to try um, to ex- you know expand expand our family and to give him a sibling. Okay. And um, yeah, and then we found out in August. I was expecting um, in ni- in twenty twenty. Um, I was expecting. Um, we didn't know it was twins at the time. Um, but I started bleeding. So then I went into the hospital and they told me there was two babies there. Um, but they weren't sure of how long or, you know, there was no heartbeat and, they, you know, they didn't know um, what was going to happen, really. Um, yeah. Um, so we found out then we went to a scan on the 16th of October. Um, I I was worried about bleeding, but I had bled on Lachlan in, in early days. I was about 11 weeks pregnant with Lachlan and I had a massive bleed so I was kind of trying to keep it up to faith and hope that everything would be okay um and then on the 16th of October we found out that both our babies had no heartbeat and they both had died 
Sorry. Oh man. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, time, yeah. Um, but I just kind of want to share about this because um, it was in the middle of lockdown. M- my husband couldn't be present. Like I, I w- wanted to ca- miscarry them naturally and let them pass naturally at home. And yeah. unfortunately, um, God had a different plan. And I ended up being uh, rushed to hospital in an, e- in an ambulance bleeding um, because I couldn't miscarry them at home. But that hospital visit was just so traumatic. I mean, they turned around and said to me that they basically uh, they had to do what's known as COVID's answer to um, um, removal of, of the fetus um, or to fetuses even. Um, and uh, which was unpleasant because it wasn't surgery or anything. And um, they turned around and said to me, the consultant, I will never forget it. And she turned around and says, oh, I suggest you wait until the pandemic um, to, until you try again. And I turned around and said to her, this is the consultant. And I turned around and said to her, I said, are you kidding me? I said, I'm almost 40. I would have been 40 that um, following June. And uh, I said, I'm almost 40. I have endometriosis, which is very severe, like. Um, and uh, I'm at high risk of miscarriage anyway. Um, and do you know what I mean? I just was like, and I don't appreciate you saying this to me. Do you no, know no, I find no, it nothing. totally yeah. unprofessional? Do you know? Well, why did you want that comment anyway? You didn't yeah. ask for her opinion, did yeah. you? Yeah. And she said, oh, I removed your products of conception. And I said, no, sorry, excuse me. They're my girls, my, my twin girls, because they were twin girls. So. Um, and how yeah. I know this, um, I'm big into the spiritual life, as I, as I previously mentioned. And a medium yeah, yeah. has told me that I have, to, I have three girls and a boy in spirit, do you know, right. that I lost. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 Um, and that is why at the beginning of this podcast, when you were talking about your children, you said living children, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, that, yeah. 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 Because I've got I'm, four I'm angels. Yeah. 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 Because I've got four yeah. angels. And I know people might think it's some people, each their own, I suppose, in a way. Yeah. But, um, you know, um, different folks, different strokes for different folks Indeed. type of thing. Um, I use a, a humor to get me through a lot of things in my life. But what I will say is I'm a mum of six. And, I'll, you know, I am a mum of six. Even though I have four in spirit, I have two living children. And I am extremely blessed and grateful for my two living children. And I will tell them about their siblings as well and as you see i don't know if you've seen i've done a fairy garden in memory of them out yeah, the yeah. front yeah and I'm, yeah um because i want to to tell them the story kind of thing and um, because if it wasn't for my four angels i wouldn't have our little evelyn who's won on thursday and i can't believe it i still can't believe that <laughs> she's here i can't believe that i'm a mum i remember getting sober and I remember I'm never going to meet someone I'm never going to be a mum do you know what I mean I was so heartbroken yeah. then thought my life kind of was over kind of thing and look at me now do you know what I mean I am extremely grateful they're the most precious things do you know what I mean like alongside my sobriety and, and Stuart my husband knows this my sobriety is here and my children are here they're on levels you know and then yeah, my yeah. husband is <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. because without sobriety and without recovery i wouldn't have them do you know what i mean got nothing you've got nothing yeah you? And no nothing do you know what as, as coming away from that really sad story to to have that moment then with you was beautiful because yeah there and there is your gratitude and when you've got gratitude like that in yeah. recovery anything's possible isn't it yeah and I, I remember saying it to my friend who's in recovery and she had an IVF baby after two losses. And we say that like, it's like, we are so blessed and grateful that our children never saw us in addiction. Like, do you know what I mean? Or, you know, um, and our behavior. And we're so, we're so blessed to kind of have broken the chain as I call it, like, because I have, you know. Um, you have. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And they've got a chance in life now that, yeah. you know, be on their wildest dreams, isn't it? Yeah, really? yeah, definitely, definitely. And they're both absolutely beautiful. They're both characters, absolute characters. Um, Lachlan, at the moment, um, we're getting them investigated for autism. So that's been kind of a bit of a struggle. Um, so it has, you know, um, but it's it's been... Um, it's been his journey and we're still obviously on it and it's, it's a long way to go. It's a three year waiting list for pediatrician referral here. It's a long time. Great, it's isn't it? Marvellous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Madness. madness. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, you know, I've been through that process myself with one of my children and, um, yeah. and, and I did it very late on in his life to be fair. Yeah. It, it was something that he wanted uh, diagnosed for himself. And we went through that uh, just over a year ago now. And yeah, it was, um, 
once the process starts, it's pretty, it's pretty quickly. It was pretty quick, but it's, it's obviously getting to that, that process. That's the, uh, that's the part that takes the time. Exactly. And, um, my, my actually Reiki therapist says that Lachlan is gifted, like he's spiritually gifted. Um, he's big into my crystals at the minute. Uh, my husband got me an advent calendar on crystals and he's just taken all of them. Basically he loves them. <laughs> he's got a lot. So, <laughs> do you know what, Ola, on one of the last topics I want to discuss, with you, I want to, I want to yeah. talk about this book. We've mentioned it a couple of times. So can you yeah. explain to me a little bit more and our viewers and listeners, what, what, how does, what's this book about? So it's um, a community that I um, I w- joined um, on Facebook called the Love Thy Body Project, and the uh, co-found the co-founder, one of the real founders of it, is Serena Novelli. So she is she's a beautiful person, um, and then there is two other co-founders, um, but she's the main kind of founder of the the project, and it's basically about a group that empowers women um, to be supportive of one another. Um, in every walk of life kind of thing and what they go through and what challenges they go through. And it really helped me because um, I've always wanted to write. I've been told by psychics that I was going to write. Um, I was going to write a book or be part of a story and it actually came true. Um, but I was always worried about how people would um, approach it or how they would feel about me writing it. And and that. Um, but it's only when I turned 40, I was like, Do you know what? This is a project. Um, it's nothing to do with I, I didn't get any money for it because it was a project um, and I didn't do it for money anyway. I wanted to do it to help others, especially women um, that have gone through or are going through what I have gone through and to let them know that um, there's light at the end of the tunnel. No matter how much darkness that life brings you, there is light. That beacon of light is called hope. And I, I actually got hope tattooed to my foot um, before my 30th birthday to remind me of myself that, that is hope. I always had hope. All through this journey, I've always had hope. Uh, but Love Thy Body Project to me is about loving yourself within. It's not a physical thing. It's nothing to do with like, you know, what size dress size you are or weight or what color hair you are. Do you know what I mean? It's within, loving yourself within and having self-love, um, uh, which is a big thing for me. So the story is, um, it's a book collaboration. There's one, two and three. I'm in book three and I'm uh, with sorry, I'm in the book with 15 other women that have been through okay. similar uh, journeys as me. Um, but it is, is very, you need, a, you need a box of tissues. It is very, very tear-jerking, mm-hmm. the stories. Yeah, yeah, really, really heartbreaking. Um, but they give a lot of people hope, do you know what I mean? And, and it's helped yeah. a lot of people. It was an Amazon um, bestseller in the areas of alcoholism, um, wow. um, women's, women in violence, uh, women in disability, Every, lots of different categories. They're actually on my um, Instagram there of all the number one categories that we got for Amazon and um, bestseller. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's you must feel lot. really proud. I am, yeah. <laughs> um, I am very, very proud. Um, but I kind of, basically, I was so brutally honest about what happened to me and people didn't know even didn't even know what happened to me like my mother-in-law read it and my sister-in-law read it and they didn't understand why I didn't drink they never understand why I didn't drink they didn't realize I had post-traumatic stress disorder until they read that book and now my mother-in-law even said it to me by reading and that has made her uh, made me make sense to her if that makes sense you know yeah no, that Um, does. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. she never could get it kind of the way I am (laughs) do you know what I mean um (laughs) Because but now I'm, she knows you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I said, I'm an open book. I, I don't really, um, I used to care what people think, but now I'm, since I turned 40, I'm like, that's it. I'm 40 years of age. Um, I'm like, no, nah, I'm just not caring what people think anymore. If people don't like me, they don't like me. I can move on and find someone that does like me, do you know? You like you. Didn't yeah, you? You exactly. Like you. Yeah, I told him. Know, yeah. yeah, I told a new friend of mine. Actually, her son has autism. He was diagnosed there yesterday with autism, and he's three. And um, I told her actually, I was doing this podcast, and I said, "Oh, I've something to tell you. I'm in. I've, I'm in recovery." Because she asked me what the podcast was, and I said, "Oh, I'm in recovery. I'm 18 years sober. Please God, a day at a time this year." Yeah, yeah. You know. And she was like, "Oh my yep. God, that's a fantastic achievement." She's like. And I was like, I was afraid I didn't know how to tell her, you know, but I wanted to tell her because she's on my Instagram. So she'll see it anyway. Yeah, you know? of course. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? I wear, I wear my sobriety like a badge of honor, really, yeah. because I think, you know, without it, you ain't the person you yeah. are today, are you? That's the no, reality. No, no, definitely. And if you like the person you are, then your sobriety is part of that. It's a massive part of that journey, isn't it? 
Oh, it's definitely. I mean, I told patients, I probably shouldn't have told patients I'm in sobriety, but they knew by talking to me sometimes. And like I've met patients that have been sober, long time sober. I Patients ringing, reading the steps, the book, the step book and the big book before they passed away. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's just the people I've met in my nursing career actually just absolutely amaze me. Like, do you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so what? So tell me, what is the? What do you think the future holds for you and your family? What's the um, plan? You got a plan? <laughs> I'm try, trying to be spontaneous and not to make too much plans. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, career-wise, I'm a stay-at-home mum. I've given up my nursing career um, because of all the baby loss and everything. I found the tr- hospital triggering. And the hospital okay. set and triggering. So I've decided after 17 years of nursing that I just call it a day. So I've I've called it a day in my nursing um, a couple of years ago, actually. Um, no, yeah, it'll be two years not working now in April. Yeah, um, because after the fourth loss, um, the team I was working for COVID, they were just so unsy- unsympathetic. I was going through Tommy's, who's the baby loss, you know, the Tommy's the consultant uh, recurrent miscarriage clinic um, and they just weren't supportive at all. So I just thought, you know what, my family is the most important thing. And I believe in my heart, I wouldn't have gotten pregnant with Evelyn had I been in that stressful job anyway. Um, yeah, I'll get that. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And nursing has never been the same since I got sober. Do you know, it just hasn't um, been the same. And uh, maybe it's because I've changed and I, and I maybe. view people differently. Yeah. What about um, working in the addiction field in any way? Would that yeah. be something that you would ever look at? Um, my actually good friend that had the IVF baby works in that area, actually. So okay. she does, yeah, she works in the addiction services in Leicester, um, Leicestershire. It, um, possibly, I'm not sure, too sure um, at the minute. I've, I've worked as a nurse in that area. Um, yeah, I've, worked, yeah. I've, worked, I've worked in sexual health as a nurse as well, um, which I enjoyed. Um but uh, I don't know. I kind of want to go the alternative holistic route. So I don't know if yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah, I've noticed I'm qualified as an angelic Reiki therapist at the minute. Okay, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So yeah, yeah. that happened in September. My therapist, I did the course with Vicky um, Hughes, my my therapist, my Reiki therapist. Um, so I'm qualified in that. It's just premises and, and business yeah, yeah, and all yeah. that kind of head. Getting it all set together, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But listen, what will be, will yeah. be. Yeah, um, exactly. I'm kind of leaving it up I open because I'm spontaneous a, a bit as well. I, I kind of, although I'm into the psychic life and spiritual life, I kind of like yeah, yeah. to have a bit of surprise thrown in the middle. That's me as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Right, I've got one last question, yeah. right? Yeah. Before I ask the question, I want to say a massive thank you for your beautiful Aww, honesty today. Thanks. And I genuinely mean that uh, from my heart. I, I really mean that. Um, mm. But I want to ask you the same question that I ask everyone else. If you've got a newcomer or someone struggling or someone, you know, early in or whatever it might be, what would be one piece of advice that you can leave them with today? I think for me, it was like, get to a meeting whether you want to be there or not do you know what I mean like there was times like through sleet snow rain do you know what I mean whether I wanted to be at a meeting I got to a meeting if I need to get to a meeting get to a meeting don't care what anything you know what you say if you say something and you think it's going to upset people in the room or anything just speak openly and honestly from your heart and then you'll be okay and always have hope definitely always grab hope because there is light at the end of the tunnel that's what I'll say Hope there is my thing. is my favorite word. I actually was going to call my daughter Hope, but my friend in recovery got there first. The IVF baby is Hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But listen, you are yeah. right. All that there is always hope, and as long yeah. as you've got hope in your heart, yeah. you've you've got a chance. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Thank you so yeah. much for coming Aww. on the Sober Street Podcast. Thank you. It's been a Thank pleasure, you. an honor. Thank you. Bye. Guys, I hope you're enjoying the Sober Street Podcast and the episode today. Listen, I'm asking for a massive favour here. If you like the show, you like the podcast, and you feel like you're getting relevant content from it, please like and subscribe and share the channel, yeah? The way I see this is the more people know about this channel, the more chance we've got of spreading the message of recovery. And that might change one person's life. And if we do, that's enough. But let's look at it in a different way. If we save one person's life, that's massive. Please like, share, subscribe. God bless.